Good afternoon. I'm Pamela Ashton, and I'm very happy to be here at the Kitchener Blues Festival with Harry Manx. Hi, Harry. How are you doing, Pam? Thanks for having me on. Thank you for being here today. Um, I understand right now Vancouver is home. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'm out there on the wet coast, and uh, it's pretty nice out there. <laughs> and you've done a fair bit of traveling. I, I had a chance to read a little bit of background information on your bio, and I understand you did sound in the clubs in Toronto um, while you were a very young man, and then you spent some time in Europe busking, and that's when you went pro, and you've never looked back. That's right. I, I was a busker for many years. Um, it was great education playing on the street. You can do what you like, and you get paid for it, and the better you are, the better you get paid. Um, but yeah, I, I've been on the musical journey for a long time. I, when I was a kid, I started as a roadie at 15. I worked for some great uh, Ontario bands, Crowbar, uh, did a tour with Rush, uh, a whole bunch of different bands. And um, that's when I got interested in not only in, in the music, but in gear and sound too, that whole, that whole story, basically. And blues, that was your first love, musically? Yeah. In the 70s, we had a lot of really active blues clubs in Toronto. Um, you go down Young Street to the Lecoq door, you could see Buddy Guy, Junior Wells playing. Uh, but I worked at the uh, El, El Macombo upstairs. I was the sound guy there for a while. And we had great acts there. We had all of them. We had Muddy, we had uh, Willie Dixon, we had uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan played there, the, the whole bunch of them. Beautiful. So you were entrenched in it and something moved you and you started. When did you start playing guitar? Well, I started uh, about 15 um, and I, you know, I messed around with it till I was uh, like 1920. Then I became a street musician over in Europe and, um, you know, I just played simple songs of Bob Marley, Bob Dylan, you know, all the Bobs I played. them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, me I messed around in the guitar. There was a point in my life where I decided that I really wanted to play better and I had to, you know, step up my game. And um, that was later on in my life, actually, when I was living in India. I lived in India about 12 years, and I didn't have much to do, so I practiced a lot. And those were the, day, the years that I stepped up my playing. And if I, can, if I could stop you right, right there, what, what was the drive? What made you decide one day, yep, yeah, i got to step this up. I'm no longer satisfied at this level. Do you recall a certain event or a certain moment that you had that eureka i'm getting better yeah actually i do uh you know i was doing a kind of um you know i was doing a kind of a, a course a kind of motivational course just for fun you know to see how this whole thing works and the lady there was talking about you know well you get your goal and then you just have to visualize all the things that between you and that goal you know so i was thinking well, what would my goal be well i'd like to be a bit better player so then I realized, okay, if I did every day, you know, a couple hours, I'd get good in this time. So I decided to do like four or five hours a day, and I did that for five years, and um, that worked. <laughs> I, I also read um, an interesting story. It seems that humor is part of your your ambience, your energy. It, it, there's a there's a lightness and there's a joyfulness and. Um, I, I read a story about you rehearsing with your tutor and his family jamming at night after having a, one of those four-hour rehearsals you just... Um, and you sneak in a little bit of blues in there and them finding that kind of funny. Can, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, they, for Indian musicians, um, classical music is a pretty serious affair. And we studied, you know, with that in mind. But at night, we used to sort of uh, loosen up and, and just jam. And we'd, we'd play jam on Bollywood tunes or, you know, they would play grooves. And, and that's when I would play a little blues. And, and uh, you know, they found that really funny that uh, sort of inject that into their Indian music. And they loved the sound of it. And it was also very strange and foreign sound to them. Um, but in a way, that was the sort of the... Uh, I had a real epiphany in that moment because I thought, well, if these guys are, are digging this blues, maybe in the West they'll dig a little Indian music too mixed in with the blues. And that's when I started to think about, you know, bringing those two styles together. But what it takes is having a good understanding of blues and having a good understanding of Indian music 
that's when you start to be able to find out where the common ground is. And it seems it's so fluid and it's so natural, it's so original listening to you play and it does it reaches out I mean it must be an incredible feeling to be able to bridge cultures bridge languages and in music and make people feel something whether or not they understand the words that are coming out mm -hmm. well yeah well all those things there's kind of like the fringe benefits you know <laughs> um, what I started out really was doing was uh, following my passion you know I love the blues and then when I heard Indian music I heard a depth and a sound that the blues didn't go to so I got into the Indian music so I'm just sort of following my path and um, I'm glad that it's working for folks you never know you know uh, you do what you do and you put it out there and you hope some of it sticks <laughs> Well, I think it's sticking quite well. Six Juno nominations. You're you've done nine records in eight years. Um, can you? You're sitting with a beautiful vena. Can you walk us around this instrument a little, perhaps? What we got here basically is um, there's two layers of strings. There's the top layer, but there's also a lower layer. Now when I play the, the top ones, the bottom ones sing by themselves. Because they're in tune. Oh, wow. And I tune those bottom ones here, and I tune it to the particular scale of the song we're going to play, whatever song that is. So it's really, um, the string arrangement is the same as the, as the sitar. There's five chikaris. There's our context, and there's three strings to play on. Two Ds and an A, which basically there's, you know, I'm basically playing on two strings, because two of them are tuned the same out of the three, so it's it's not easy to play chords on this instrument. It's made for monotone scales and, um, and playing in one key only. Um, but it is possible. I hint at chords, and uh, I play tunes with chords on this, but uh, it's not easy, really. There's, it has its, really, its limits. I'm sure tuning it is uh, an epic journey also. Yeah. Well, you'd spend the first... Uh, you'd spend the first year or so of playing this, uh, just learning how to tune it. in major, okay. That's amazing. It sounds so bright. Yes, it has. Has 21 strings in total. And um, I can tune it. When I want to change it from major to minor, I change the seventh and the third for all you guitar heads. Take it down to minor. There we go. Um, now, you had three of these built, and you currently have one left? Well, actually, I had five made, and I've got two left, but close enough. Yeah, I get, you know, you find people that just need one, and I found some people that needed one, and they got it, and my brother weaseled one out of me. <laughs> Now, how does this stand up touring? Is it a fragile instrument? Is it, uh, is it um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sense, yes, susceptible to weather and humidity? 
Oh no, it's not bad. You know, it's it's made from pretty cheap materials. Actually, it's made in India, handmade, without any electric uh, tools whatsoever. No electric drills or saws. It's all handmade. It's made out of plywood. It's pretty strong. The main thing is, though, you got to have a good case. I've got a fiberglass case that you know I've had for 10 years, and it's got some nicks on it, but it's really uh, protected it well. And uh, yeah, if you got a good case, you can fly it around. It's not a problem. I just put new tuning heads on the whole thing. I got those uh, go-to tuning heads. They have a really great tuning ratio. Like you can get right in there and fine tune it, and it and it really holds the note. Um, uh, those are a real treat. Got them from Japan. They got ebony on top, and um, I just had this this pickup put in, and it, and I had to suspend it between the two layers of strings below there in the top so I built a little um, a bridge for it and I sort of hung it between the two strings and that's uh, one of those new national pickups the slimline and it sounds great it's got a real good tone and it picks up underneath and above so it gets the two string sets of strings there that's really key to getting a good sound a good pickup I run this through um, API preamp and the API graphic EQ, which I have on the stage, to tweak it a little bit. Um, the the preamp is so key to getting a good sound, you know, on the stage. Um, I use a couple of TC pedals for verb and delay, not too much, just to give a little color, you know, to make it a little wet. And um, that's about it, pretty much. I don't use any amplifiers. I go straight into the PA system and let them send it back in the monitors. Um, that's a, yeah, and it's easier for touring, you know, no amp, you just plug and play. And, uh, yeah, that's about it. It's, it's a quite a beast. It's hard to play in many ways, but it's, it's got a great sound. And uh, once you get it going, it's, it's, it's got an amazing depth to it. And this is your go-to instrument. This is your primary. Yeah, this is the one I really like to play the most, you know, uh, though I play a lap steel and a, a banjo and a national and a cigar box, all that stuff, but this is the one that I really, um, when I'm going to go at home somewhere and sit and play quietly, this is the one I take, and uh, I love it. In terms of technology, has technology affected your playing, your writing, the way you record? Totally. You know, I, my last album, I, I pretty much... Uh, I wrote the tunes and then I on my phone I recorded them on my phone and then I emailed them to a friend who was in the studio and he set up this, the tracks and we basically did the album you know got the album all prepared with the phone I I found the studio with my navigator you know it's like that whole that phone made my whole last record I had all the words in there I wrote a lot of the words on the phone, you know, when I was traveling. And how does a song come to you? Is it usually the same? Is it melody first, lyrics later? How does that seed germinate for Harry Makes? Well, you know, I write words and then I write music, very separate. And I, you know, I, my computer I write poetry and I, I look at ideas and then I try to find those right words for the right song and I put them together. And um, uh, that happens mostly on the road, you know, uh, while I'm moving around. I write most of those tunes. Um, I'm just working on last week I recorded my, what will be my 12th record in 12 years. <laughs> and uh, it's got some nice tunes on there, including a song which I put on a, on a record with Kevin Bright um, called Carry My Tears. And that one uh, got me nominated for Songwriter of the Year this year. So. Congratulations, that's awesome. Yeah, so I put that song on, uh, the new one, too. And when can we expect that to hit stores? Uh, that'll come out in the fall, in the fall of 2012. Yeah, it should be good. And what's your touring schedule like going forward? Well, I'm here today, gone tomorrow, <laughs> to uh, Quebec. I'm uh, off to do a tour in, in, uh, in Quebec, about 20 shows around there. And then I think I'm... Going to Europe. We've got some Europe stuff coming up. I just came back from Australia. I was three months in Australia, so long tour there. This is my rest time. I only work weekends, so it's... It's rest time when you're only working on weekends and working on another record. Yeah. There is no rest for Harry. No, no, man. 
You know, I put my first, here's something for all you young guitar players. I put my first record out, my first CD, when I was 46. So, you know, you don't want to be rushing into it. Uh, I'm 57 now, and it's all good. So. <laughs> and there's a ton more music to come out of Mr. Manx, isn't there? Still got a couple more albums in me. <laughs> We're looking so forward to watching you play this afternoon and so very grateful that you came to sit with us. Today.